Thank you, ladies. Um, Anna, what, what you just shared, the scripture, I know a lot of people uh, that ministered to them, I know that they needed to hear that, and I know that, um, that there are people in the church that need to hear that as, as well, that probably are watching online today, so thank you for sharing that, um, as well as, this is the awesome song too, so. Amen. All right. All right. All right. Well, like I said, if I, I start seeing you guys fall asleep, just go up behind somebody and slap them in the back. No, <laughs> it's okay. If you need to stand up, get that blood flowing, that's okay. I'll just think you're praising the Lord or something. You know, it's all. We do that. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Come on now. So I know it's, it's rough. That, that time change is mean stuff. Oh, yeah. Who thought about that anyway? Uh, all right. Uh, real quick before I get into the sermon this morning, uh, I do want to mention that next Tuesday uh, we are doing that food box giveaway with Gwinnett County. Uh, it'll be uh, starting at 4 o'clock. If you are going to volunteer and you're going to help out with that, if you could be here by 3 or 3.30 uh, to kind of get things going, well, that would be awesome. Um, I completely understand if, if you're working, you can't get off work, that, that, that's no problem. Um, but if you can't be here, if, if you want to be here around 3, 3.30, we'll start prepping and doing some things then. Uh, next Sunday uh, morning, right after the, the service, I want to just briefly meet with everybody who's going to be able to help out just for five minutes down front. We'll just kind of give some basic instructions and give you some more details like that. So if you're planning on volunteering next Tuesday, the 23rd for the food box giveaway, um, just if you just plan on staying about five minutes after the service and we'll just kind of discuss a few things, make sure everybody knows what's gonna happen and uh, that that will be that. So, all right, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to it. What the Lord's gonna do and uh, how he's gonna use this uh, to, to help our community out. So. All right. Well, uh, let's let's get into the sermon here. Um, last week we started a new series uh, called Known, and you know it's it's all about how God reveals Himself to us. Um, we we started looking at some questions, and if you're familiar with these questions, uh, I'll have Ashlyn put them on there. We talked about uh, these this kind of these different ones. You know, people start out with, "Does God exist?" And then we go from there all the way to the top like, well, okay, how can you Christians, how do you know that God exists? How can you boldly claim that? You know, and we talked about the different steps in between there. Thank you. Yeah. You know, uh, last week we looked at how God reveals himself through creation and through our conscience, that, that outwardly in creation and inwardly in our, in our conscience there. And, and so we looked at, the, I guess, the first step there, which God is the right God? We, we can see that creation shows us that there is a creator and that design shows us that there's a designer in, in all those different areas um, and that can lead us so far you know that we we can make some basic assumptions about who God is that he's powerful that he's personal that he's intelligent because he designed things and so we can get somewhat of a, a pretty good basic description of, of what God is like. Well, today we're going to kind of finish. You see my little, my, my drawing skills are not that good. So <laughs> I need a graphic designer anyway. But, <laughs> you know, we're, we're building this foundation or this building, so to speak, there. Uh, and, you know, last week we did creation and conscience. Today we're going to look at, okay, how else has God revealed himself to us? There, we talked about what we called general revelation last week. And then this week we're going to look at something we call special revelation or sometimes it's called specific revelation and how God reveals himself uh, to us in specific ways, in special ways. So go ahead, go to the next slide, Ashlyn. Sorry there. Just kind of as a reminder, general revelation last week was knowledge about God given to all people. That's, that's the key point there. All people for the purpose of making known that God exists, that he exists. Uh, everyone sees creation. Everyone has a conscience that they, they recognize good and evil from. They, they, we see something, we say, that's evil. You know, that, that act of injustice or 9-11 or whatever that was. The, the, that is given to everybody. So today we're looking at um, special revelation. This is a, a little bit different. Here's kind of a basic definition. What exactly is special? Well, it's special. Okay, special revelation is uh, just kind of a basic definition. It says something like this. People can learn about God's character. I know there's a lot of blanks here. So you feel, <laughs> People can learn about God's character, his will, his purpose for creation, and his plan of redemption because God has revealed himself 
in this way that we can know him. So I'll say that one more time. Special revelation is, is a way that people can learn about God's character, his will, what he desires, what he wants, uh, his purpose for creation, what, what's all this for, what is, what is it all about, uh, his plan of redemption, because God revealed himself this way. Uh, and because of that, we can know him. So there we come in as, as believers, as followers of Christ to say, yes, we can know that God exists through various ways, but we can also know God in a personal way, and we can know what he's like and what his will is and what his desire is. And we're going to look at the, the two different ways that God reveals himself uh, specifically or through special revelation. Um, number one in your outline is uh, God specifically revealed himself through the written word. If you'll go, if you'll go with me to Second Peter chapter 1. Um, we'll kind of start off on this passage and then we'll kind of branch off into some other places but this, this, uh, these few verses in Second Peter chapter 1 really kind of describe everything that we're going to be talking about today so I think it's a great passage to look at and see both of the ways that God specifically revealed himself to us um, let me start in verse 12 here uh, so I always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth that you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this tent of this body, of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made it clear to me, and I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So here is Peter God has revealed to him, he said, hey, my time on earth is, is about done. It's, it's about over. God has revealed to me that my time's coming to an end. He, he felt like, uh, you know, the, the persecution that was after him was coming to a, a place where he could no longer continue and, and it would be caught. And, you know, we know that the, uh, eventually the tradition says that he was crucified uh, upside down because he didn't want to be uh, crucified like the Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, so he's writing to them, he's kind of, he's giving them their farewell thing here, and then he goes on here in, uh, in uh, verse uh, 16, he says, For we did not follow cleverly invented stories when I told you about the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the, maje from the majestic glory, saying, this is my son, whom I love and whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice and came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. And we have the word for the prophets made more certain, and you do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So just in these few verses right here, we see two specific ways that God revealed himself through, number one, the written word, and then number two, we'll get to in just a minute, the, the living word. So I want us to look at the living word first, uh, excuse me, the written word first. Um, and we see from this passage here, especially verse 20, 21, is really, really talks about the, the scripture here, that, that God used people to, to speak and also to record the words of scripture. Uh, you know, it, it was through man from God. If you kind of want to put it together, it was, a, it was a combination effort. It was from God through man. That, that was the thing. Look at verse 20. It says that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation that God used men to speak these words back in the Old Testament and then it was eventually recorded, written down. And God used men, again, to record the words of the Lord and write that down. So that's, that's what we see there. Now, I, I, want, I just want to address real quick one objection. You may say, wait a minute, Pastor John. How could sinful man, imperfect man that has an evil heart and corrupt, how could they correctly record the words of God and not mess it up. 
you know, we have all these mistakes all the time and, and people are imperfect. And you, you may be wondering that yourself or maybe you have a friend that, that wonders that. Um, let me just give you a thought here and then we can go a little bit more into detail uh, next week, okay? But just, just a simple little phrase here. God can use a crooked stick to draw a straight line, can he not? Right? You know, you, you ever taken like, you ever gotten bored maybe and you're taking a paper clip and you tried to straighten one of those out and make it like perfectly straight? It's almost impossible, right? Unless you get like a bunch of pliers and you know, whatever. But you know, as, as much as we try to follow Christ and in our human ability, we're imperfect people. But it's God's supernatural ability to use us to inspire the, the writers of the, the Old Testament. Now, there's, we'll talk about this a little bit next week when we can get into um, inspiration and inerrancy. Uh, we'll get into this a little bit more in detail. But it is possible for an all-powerful supernatural God to use imperfect men to draw that straight line, if you will, so to speak. And so that's just a, a thought I want to leave you with, and, and we'll come back to that next week uh, and get that a little bit more in detail. We'll spend some more time with that. But, um, but verse 21 there, it says, Therefore prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. It's, it's not from man. You know, and by the way, if somebody ever says that to you, I don't believe anything written by man, you know, well, you say, well, you know, well, everything is written by men. <laughs> so do you believe anything? You know, the, that's when you kind of turn that on itself. You know, if somebody struggles with that, the, the, everything we have is written by men. So we, where do you go? Um, you don't even believe that. So well, just one, one extra thought there. But it says that prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. You know, man is the vessel that God uses. Um, we're going to see here, verse 21, that it is a Holy Spirit guided process. That's what the scripture says here, verse 20, 21. It says that they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who influenced them. You know, and there's all these different, there's four or five different uh, interpretations. I remember going through seminary in my basic classes, and there's four or five different thoughts. Of, well, was it a dictation mode, or was it, you know, we, if you want to have that discussion with me, we can do that sometime during the week, and we can talk about the different ways that, that perhaps God inspired these people to do that, but not here, <laughs> not now. Okay, so we'll just table that, but uh, there's a lot of good stuff in that. But this Holy Spirit guided this process. He used people to record, to write down the words of the Lord and to give it to us, to explain it. Um, you know, the Bible is, is very complex, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, some people can sit down and read a, a novel, you know, in a, a week or two or a couple of days. But when it comes to, like, reading the Word of God... It's a struggle. Why, why is that? Well, I think one of the reasons why is because it, it contains so much truth and so much to process and so much power. You know, the, the Timothy says that it's, you know, alive and active. It, it affects us when we read it. We just can't read it like a novel. It's, it's different. Um, and, and I fully understand that there are difficulties in the Bible. You know, there, there many people have pointed out things to me. Well, the Bible talks about slavery and it, it represses women and they, they'll name different things, um, you know, or um, stuff like that. And, you know, there's Old Testament, the annihilation passages and the Canaanites and, and, and there are real struggles that we have to deal with and things that we have to understand. Uh, but here's the thing with that. We, we have to understand that the Bible is not written to us but it was written for us. Right? We have to remember that the Bible was re recorded for a whole other generation and culture 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. And, and we come to it today in our civilized, you know, oh, we read stuff in there. Well, I don't understand that. What does that say? And, and we don't look at it in the context in which it was written. And, I, and that will be your first problem. If you go to the Bible and you read stuff and you don't understand the context in which it was written in, you're going to have some problems. So that's why it's our part to go and to dig and to look at the culture, look at the historical context. Um, that, that is so important. Um, a friend, or not a friend, just a, an apologist I know, named Greg Kokel, uh, he explains it like this. He says, think about the Bible as kind of a union rules book. You know, unions come about because workers aren't being treated right, or, you know, that, and they stick up for the workers. Maybe some of you are a part of a union at your job or something like that. Um, 
and, and so these unions are formed to kind of make sure that people are taken care of. Well, that's what most of the Old Testament is, is written kind of like. When sinful man started doing certain things that God never intended, God kind of came in and said, okay, we need to have some laws here. We need to talk about divorce. We need to talk about how you treat a slave and how this happens. And so that's where most of these laws from the Old Testament come from. And, and if you look at the laws in the Old Testament compared to any of these other ancient writings like the Code of Haram, Harambi and all these other things, the, the moral character is like so far above what human people were willing to do and stuff. So that's kind of how we need to see that. If that example kind of helps you out a little bit there, I hope that that does. Um, one thing I want to I re recommend a, a resource to you. This is, if you're... If you're saying, okay, how do I interpret the Bible? What, what, how, how do I read it correctly? This is the best book I think you can buy for beginners. This is called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. It's by uh, two authors, Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. Uh, this is it's an easy read. Uh, it will take you through all the different genres in the Bible and how you should look at them. It will give you examples of that. Um, and I, and I, I thought about this this week. If you're a Bible study teacher and you would like a copy of this book, you just text me or come to me and tell me, Pastor John, I like that because I believe if you read this book as a Bible study teacher or an assistant teacher, it will help you in your teaching your class. And I will gladly gift you the, a book. So if that would be something you would like, if you want to buy it yourself, that's fine. But I will be glad to gift you this book because I believe it's that valuable. Um, it, it's called How to Read Your Bible for All It's Worth. It's just a basic understanding of how you can read through the Bible and it helps you see that different context and, and really understand that. That's that's just a, a great place to start. It's it's a it's a just a, a solid piece of, of, of literature that many people have used and you can explain it. So I, I just recommend it to you uh, if you're a teacher or, or anybody. You don't have to be a teacher. You can just want to know more about the Word of God and say I want to I want to dig in. So let's I just want to recommend that to you. So. Quickly, let me let me let's go to and there's I made a mistake here in your in your bulletin it, it might say Titus two thirteen that's my fault I I told um, I told Stacy I gave her the wrong scripture this week but it's it's First Thessalonians I, I had my T's wrong I guess First Thessalonians two thirteen uh, so scratch that out in your outline but if you want to go to First Thessalonians two thirteen with me. I saw some of you shaking your heads like, yeah, I looked that up. That's not what I was like. Uh, you, what are you doing, John? All right, here. Uh, let's read this. It says, and when, this is Paul writing to the church there in Thessalonica. He says, and we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but actually as it is the word of God which is at work at you who believe. So here, here's an example in the New Testament where Paul is bringing the gospel on his mission trips, and so he's calling it the Word of God here. Do you see that? And we're going to look at this next week. I'm going to show you where Paul and Peter even point to each other in the New Testament and say, hey, what they're saying is Scripture. What they're saying is the Word of God. They recognize not only the Old Testament, but also the New Testament as the Word of God. And here Paul just kind of makes a reference to it in 1 Thessalonians. But um, So it's not the Word of men, like Paul said here, but actually as it is, the Word of God. And we'll talk about this next week as we go into detail there. But... Um, all right, number two on your outline, the second way that God reveals himself to us is through the living word. Um, now, to help you kind of, okay, the living word is talking about Jesus Christ here. Um, you know, to help you understand who is Jesus uh, and what, what does he teach, what has he said, uh, I, I just want to help you with this little, I guess, I don't know if it's a mnemonic device or whatever you want to call it, an acronym, whatever. But if you just remember GCH and then the number one, okay? Remember the ones. If you want to know who Jesus is, just remember these three letters and, and go to these passages in these three books of the Bible. All right, they're all in chapter one of each of these three books, and they tell us a lot about who Jesus is. They they show us who he is, what what he taught about himself, and not only about about God there, but so we're gonna look at these three things. So the first one is John chapter one, and you're probably familiar with this. Um, 
Let me turn there myself. If you've been on our mission trips, you know this is one of the verses that we use all the time. But John chapter 1, uh, 1 through 14, I'm just going to read the first five verses here, and then I'm going to skip down to verse 14. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. And then if you go all the way down to verse 14, we kind of understand what, what's this word, capital W, in, in the first chapter of John here. What is this talking about? Well, verse 14 says that... Uh, that when I find it, excuse me, there, that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory and the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So that Word, capital W there, is just a poetic way to describe Jesus Christ. He is the living Word. That word in, in Greek, logos, is, is the word that is used to describe the living Word. Um, so, what do we learn here in John chapter 1? Well, the very first verse says that, that the Word was with God and the Word was God. Now, in my peon of a brain here, the only, the only way that that verse makes sense, that someone is with God and is God, is that it's the Trinity. All right, you know, my Jehovah's Witness brothers will freak out and ah, I don't understand that. But, but according to, uh, and I guess I shouldn't call them brothers because I don't believe they, they serve the same God. But, anyway, but, um, but uh, anyway, sorry. But the word is with God and the word was God. That only makes sense in the view of the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is, is a complex thing to understand, but I, I want to just tell you that's what the Bible describes. It's, it's one what and three who's. That's what the Bible teaches about the Trinity there. So we learn that, that Jesus is God and Jesus is with God. And then verse 3, it says that the Word created everything. So Jesus is creator. He, he had just as much part in creation as the Father did. And then verse 14 says that the Word, that Jesus, dwelt among us. I mean, that, that's what we call his incarnation. He came to earth. God, you know, the best way that he revealed himself to us was in the flesh, in person. And we're going to see what that entails here in just a minute. So that's J, that's John. The next letter there on your little uh, an acronym is, is C, and that's for Colossians chapter 1. So flip over, if you will, go to Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to learn a little bit more about who Jesus is. Y'all are way ahead of me, or you're falling asleep. I don't hear any pages turning. So. All right, Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 15 through 20 says this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Listen to verse 19, 20 here. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So here in Colossians, we learn a lot about who Jesus is. The verse 15 says that he is the image of the invisible God. That image in Greek, the imago, is, is talking about like an image on a coin, something that, that represents what, you know, a lot of times in, in the Roman times, they would put the, the emperors would put their own face on that coin when they were in power, and that represented them. The, so he's the image of the invisible God. Verse 16, again, describes him as creator. It says that for by him all things were created. And then later on it says that by him and for him. So it even talks about that creation was created for his purpose for his purposes. Um, then if you go down to verse 19 and 20, this is where I think it's important. It says that God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. The fullness of God dwelled within Jesus. 
So Jesus is not just like vice president. <laughs> he, he is fully God as much as the Father is God and the Holy Spirit is God. He is fully God. You know, now Jesus did limit his powers and use his abilities in certain ways while he was in the flesh. But according to scripture, the fullness of God resided in him. Uh, verse 20 also says that he was, he was our reconciler there. It says that he redeemed us through his blood shed on the cross. So we see a little bit of his purpose there. What did God want? Well, he wanted to reconcile us. He wanted to bring us back to redeem us into a right relationship with him that was marred by sin. And now if you'll go with me to the, the last passage here, Hebrews chapter 1. This is my favorite. I love this. Ralph read it uh, Wednesday night when he was uh, leading prayer meeting. But I love these first four verses. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. Uh, it's just, man, it's, it's so great. And it, it again tells us who exactly Jesus is here. It says, In the past, God spoke to our fathers, forefathers, excuse me, though through the prophets and at many times in many various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word after he had provided purification for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven and so became as much superior to the angels as the name that he inherited is superior to theirs so here we, we learn that the author says that God communicated in the past through the prophets and through other various ways there and he, and he says but in these last days God has spoken to us through his son that is the way he's done it, through Jesus Christ. And so we see here that, again, Jesus is, is labeled and called creator. He's, he's part of that. Not only that, but he's also sustainer. He creates things. But according to verse 3, it says he sustains everything by the powerfulness of his word. He holds it all together. You ever think about that? That everything that was brought together with creation, is, man, that's powerful. But at the same time, God holds it together together. By his word, by his will, that he desires it to stay. And one day that may change. I don't know. But, um, but then also there, the last three, he says that he is the exact representation of his being. Again, you get, you get another example. Now, now, wait a minute. You say, well, hang on. Who, who says this? Well, we don't know who the author of Hebrews is, but we know who John and Colossians were. But these were his followers. These were people that spent time with Jesus. They heard his teachings. These are the things that they drew from spending a number of years with him. These are the things that Jesus taught. And now they're, they're fleshing them out. They're writing them out. And so if you're going to trust anybody, you're going to trust the people that knew him best. Um, you know, and now some of you may say, wait a minute. Don't you see what you're doing, Pastor John? You're talking about Jesus in the Bible. That you're saying that the Bible is the way that God revealed himself. So it's kind of like you're cheating a little bit, Pastor John. Well, not really. Uh, it, there are, you can count on two hands the number of people who are actually bona fide biblical New Testament scholars and atheists, skeptics alike. Uh, you can probably count less than 10 actual people that actually believe that Jesus never existed. I'm talking about, I mean, you always find the crazy people on, online. I understand that. But, you know, you know he, was, he was a legend. Yeah. But I'm talking about bona fide scholars, people that study and that know history and know that. You can find probably less than 10 people that actually that believe that Jesus never existed. 90-something percent of all New Testament scholars, and I'm, I'm saying people like Bart Ehrman, who's like the strongest atheist and New Testament scholar out there. He doesn't believe the Bible. But he says Jesus existed. Uh, they say that. Now you say, well, you're using the Bible. That's not fair. You can't do that. Well, let me. what if I told you there are 19 other sources outside the Bible that refer to Jesus and the Christians? There are, there are sources of people that make fun of Jesus for his claim of being born of a virgin. There are 19 other. You say, well, that's only 19. Only 19? Well, that's, think about how long it is. We, we have less than that when it comes to like copies of Homer and some of these others. So that, that's a lot. 
So th there is great evidence that Jesus existed. And like I said, you know, that's just something, you know, again, if that struggle is there for you, I understand that. Let's, let's go to lunch. Let's have a talk. Let's, let's dig into that a little bit later, uh, maybe on some other time. But there is, there's great evidence there. Um, I just want to take the last five minutes to kind of address something that I, I threw up to you last week. You know, we, we started kind of asking a bunch of these questions, and I kind of laid a little bit of a, uh, I guess what do you call that, a hook with you last week. You know, we, we talked about how is it possible, can someone who only sees general revelation, because remember from last week, general revelation is seen by everyone. Everyone sees creation. Everyone has a conscience. We, we know good and evil. We recognize that. I, I threw this question out. Is it possible for someone who only, or who has seen creation and conscience, is it possible for them to go to heaven with or without knowing who Jesus was? Because that question may, may come up at your work or may come up amongst friends. What about the people who've never heard of Jesus? Do they go to heaven? What kind of God would do that? You know, we know the scriptures. We know that 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 the Bible's pretty clear that, you know, John 14, 6, that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So how do we handle that? What kind of a thing? And I, and I'm, I realize I'm, I'm going to give you a five-minute answer that probably needs about three hours. But again, let's have a conversation. If this, this is something that you want to know more about, call me up. Text me. Let's, let's go to lunch. Let's sit down. Let's talk about this. But let me, let me give you a couple of thoughts here. Uh, on the bulletin there, you see some scriptures and some different uh, points. I want to point you to those, but I want to go, if you will, just to Romans chapter 10, because I, I think this is a key verse when it comes to talking about this issue. What about somebody who's never heard of Jesus? Do they go to heaven? You know, so let's, let's, let's look at some things here. Let me give you some thoughts here. Starting in verse 12, Romans chapter 10, verse 12. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they have been sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes by hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But I ask you, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world, and again I asked, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you envious by those who were not a nation, and I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I've held up my hand to a disobedient and obstinate people. Uh, there's, there's a lot in there, and I just want to encourage you to kind of go back maybe after today and, and read through that. But this passage kind of seems to uh, suggest a couple different things. Number one, that it was already mentioned there uh, that, that uh, the, the quote from Psalm 19, there are verse 18 in Romans 10 there. He says, their voice has gone out into the earth and their words to the end of the world. That's a quote from Psalm 19, which we talked about last week, that creation shows that. Um, so this, but this passage here and some others we'll look at here really kind of shows us that the voices that point to the Lord are leading to something that, that for people who look and respond for God and say, okay, God, you've revealed something about yourself, but I want to know more. So there's a little bit more to this here. And we see, um, see some of these passages here, you know, um, he says there, I was found for those who did not seek me. Some people look for the Lord and they find him. But also there, there are people who the Lord just kind of comes up and whacks them in the back of the head and says, hey, <laughs> I'm here. Think, think about Paul, right? He was, he was zealous for persecuting the Christians. He was doing his own thing. And the Lord found him and, and came to him and used him. It was kind of one of those unexpected type things where he appeared to him. Um, 
You know, and then I'll look at the example uh, of Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. Think about, you know, the, the scriptures there describe Cornelius as a God-fearing man. That was someone who believed in God, but they weren't fully, you know, someone who had believed over like the Jews and all that. And what did God do? He called Peter, right? He says, Peter, I want you to go to the house of this centurion and I want you to share the gospel with him. Peter, like, what? <laughs> you know, but God sent him to Cornelius and that's when Cornelius gave his life to the Lord. Uh, I, I see that in scripture in multiple places. Uh, the, the passage there you see in, in Revelation 14 talks about an angel that was sent throughout the earth to share the gospel with people. And that's without human interaction there. And uh, even Acts 13 says that the gospel was spread throughout the ends of the earth right there in Acts 13, 47. Um, so, you know, sometimes for us to say, wait a minute, how does someone come to Jesus and they've never heard Jesus? Well, I'm, I'm not the smartest person, but I'm fully aware that God can do things in pretty amazing ways. And he can send people and angels to places that we have no clue. There, there are actual, I've heard someone who was a missionary before tell me that they had gone on a mission trip to a place that they knew had never been reached before. And people had heard about a savior who died for someone's sins. They didn't call him Jesus, but they, they I forget the word he used several years ago, but there are, there are testimonies like that of missionaries who go overseas and they come across these people groups and, and they come ready to share the gospel and these people groups are ready. That God revealed to these people who have not had a, a touch from the scriptures or, or through a uh, missionary about Jesus Christ, that they were already prepped and ready through God's revelation. And he kind of showed them through dreams or visions about who he was. I'm not smart enough to figure out, well, how does that all play out? I, I don't fully understand that, but I, I just know what scripture teaches. That if people are looking for light, if they're seeking truth, God will give them more light. He will show them, okay, you're honestly seeing where did this come from? Let, let me show you who the creator is. And he reveals to them. And, you know, who are we to say, well, we haven't gotten everywhere. Well, think about when Jesus came in the time of the Roman world. It was, it was the central nation that spread out around the rest of the world all throughout different areas. You know, it was just that time. The Roman world was known for a lot of different things. They created roads and systems and organization. And that's exactly when Jesus came and his disciples were after that. And who are we to say that the word didn't get out to the rest of the world? We, we have people in our, in our community that are from all over the world that know who Jesus Christ is. And because the gospel has been spread to them. And sometimes it's so easy for us to make a judgment. Well, I don't know. How do you know that? Well, I just know what the scripture says. And, I, and that's what I trust. And so I just want to encourage you there. Um, so just kind of leaving you as we wrap up here. Uh, next week, we're going to come back. We're going to take a, a deeper dive into the Bible. We're going to look at how do we know that the Bible is actually inspired and that it is inerrant? How can we boldly say, well, you believe the Bible is inerrant? Um, we're going to look at that next week. So I want to invite you to come back next week. Uh, Ashlyn, yeah, thank you. The, you know, we, here's, we're kind of building our house, right? You know, if, if we're making that argument at the top that we can say that we know God and who he is and what he's like, uh, I believe that this is, this is good stuff right here. We, we see God in creation. We know him through the conscience. And we also see that he's revealed himself through his word and through his son. And that builds a strong case. Uh, we, we will come back on Easter and talk about a little bit more about Jesus and who he is and what the claims he made. He, is he just a good teacher or is, it, or is he more? We'll look at that uh, next week. But, um, you know, again, I realize that this is very kind of a, a heady sermon for a lot of us. There's not a lot of application or practicality to it. But my, I just have two questions for you today is, is do you know God? Do you have a relationship with him personally? You know, we just read Romans 10, 13. It says that for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is there. He exists. He, he lets us know that. But it's, it's our choice whether we want to call on him or not. You know, it, it's, remember, it's, it's not about just knowing things. 
You know, it's not about having knowledge in your head, but it's trusting him with your heart. It's like the example of the, um, the, the guy who went over the Niagara Falls in the wheelbarrow several decades ago, you know? People would come and, and watch him go back and forth on this tightrope, and, and then he said, do you, do you believe I can do it? And I said, oh yeah, and he would carry all these different things in this wheelbarrow. He'd put bricks and all these crazy things, and he'd ask people, do you think I can go across with this? And they're like, oh yes, we do. And he says, do you believe that do you believe it so much that you would get in the wheelbarrow and go with me? <laughs> okay, well, I don't know about that. You know, but that's what we have to do when it comes to Christ. It, yes, you may understand that Jesus loves you and that Jesus died on the cross for you, but there's got to be a point in your life, according to Scripture, that you come to trust him with your life for yourself. You say, I want to live for you. I want you to be my Savior. And so if you've not done that this morning, I want to invite you to do that. You can do that through a, a simple prayer. It's not the words of the prayer that mean anything, but it's, it's your heart. If you want Christ to come in your life, if you want to receive him as Lord, make him Savior of your life, you can do that by just asking him. So if, if you would bow your heads, uh, nobody looking around or getting up. If, if you want to ask Christ to come in your life, say something like this. Say, Dear God, I know that you exist. I see it all around me. Today, Lord, I want to move from knowing you to trusting you. Today, God, I want you to come into my life, forgive me my sins, help me to trust you, help me to live for you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. For, for some of you today, maybe you've already come to that point. Maybe you said, I already have a relationship with Christ. And my, my, my question, I guess, to you today is, are you making him known? You may know God, but are you making him known? Are you using your influence? Are you affecting your circle of friends and family and coworkers? Are you sharing the gospel with them? Or are you silent? Are you afraid to speak up and talk about the faith that you have? And I just want to boldly challenge you. Uh, let's let's be open about it. You know, the world tells us to, to be quiet. Don't talk. You keep your religion to yourself private. But that's not what the Lord wants from us. So I just want to challenge you, wherever you're at this morning, uh, you know, whatever the Lord takes you this week, uh, just be, be yourself. Share the gospel. Share how God has changed your life and affected you. And, and maybe it will change someone else's life as well. So this morning, uh, the altar's open. If you want to come down and pray for something in your life that's going on, uh, you're welcome to do that. If you want to come down and pray for your one so that you'll have boldness and courage to be able to share, uh, we'll have some staff and deacons down here. If you want to pray with them, you can do that. Uh, this morning, if you'd like to join the church, you say, I feel like Westside is, is where I need to plant my life, my family, you're welcome to do that as well. This, this is the Lord's time. Whatever he's telling you, whatever he's speaking to you, uh, maybe maybe what JC said this morning about not knowing her father has pricked your heart. And maybe there's something that you need to deal with in what she said. And maybe you need to go to the, the altar and you need to, to give something up to the Lord. Maybe there's a struggle that you had with the father. I don't know. But whatever God's speaking to you, I pray that you listen, you move, and you act. Let's pray.